So next up is Steve Quake, who uh, continues Steve's uh, tradition of pioneering new fields and integrating complicated technology to do great new science. All right. So, uh, you know, Tom mentioned the bipolar nature of Steve's group uh, back in the days in Stanford when there was sort of the AML half and the biophysics half, and the two halves really didn't talk to each other that much. Um, <clears throat> except I did get asked once how cold I could make those DNA molecules that I was trapping. And <clears throat> we'd have these group meetings where one or the other would present, and I remember after one of them, Mark Kasovich just stalked out mumbling, DNA, blah, 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 DNA, blah, 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 under his breath. <laughs> And so uh, <clears throat> I decided to do a group meeting presentation here. Um, and I put aside my usual blah, blah DNA talk and have tried to uh, sort of illustrate the things I'm interested in right now through the use and abuse of physics and allergies. And <clears throat> uh, the first thing I'm going to talk about uh, is more about ways of doing science than a, than a specific result. Um, <clears throat> and so this being LBL, uh, sort of the birthplace of big science, thanks to the uh, uh, the development of cyclotron, and the first one was a little four and a half inch model to prove the principle, and then that led to ever larger and larger devices with larger radiuses and more heavy magnets because that allowed you to achieve uh, higher energies, and the scope and the scale of this is, is really what gave birth to big science. Uh, biology is now uh, doing the same thing, and I'll talk about that in the next slide, but uh, as a sort of aside, uh, Steve mentioned his divided loyalties last night between Stanford and Berkeley, and I took freshman physics from him uh, some years ago, and I remember him very vividly saying that uh, there were some interesting skeletons in the closet of the first cyclotron, and it took him a while before they really understood that it was working properly, and it was a huge shock to me at the time to, to, to this, this realization that the linear history you read in the books is not always the whole story. I don't know if you're more discretion now that you're back at Berkeley, but it was a very influential thing for me. So uh, the Human Genome Project was this attempt to sequence the average human genome. And DNA sequencing technology started out as a very labor-intensive uh, process where uh, you would have people pipetting things around, and you look at these gels and try to read the sequences off by the positions of the bands. And the development of automated sequencing technologies in the 80s that use laser-induced fluorescence and uh, uh, gave you these, uh, these things where you could automatically call a sequence were an enormous advance, and that's what enabled uh, the sequencing of the human genome, like basically by making huge rooms, warehouses, full of these machines all running in parallel. And <clears throat> there's different ways to calculate how much it cost, uh, but I think both groups would probably agree that after the first genome was done, to do it again would cost about $100 million in reagent costs, and, and there's probably consensus on that. And so it was an enormous endeavor. Uh, and one of the ways in which big biology is different than big physics is that uh, in, in biology, the people who invent instruments and those who use them to do measurements are two entirely different groups. And uh, that's not the case in physics. It tends to be uh, one group. And uh, people who do this were not the ones who invented this. And this is more like uh, what you would call systems integrators, I guess, today in the aerospace industry. They take the existing technology. They want to buy it in a box. And so if you're interested in, in trying to develop new technologies, you have to bear that in mind, that you can't just publish a paper and expect people to go out and adopt the techniques. Um, you have to give it to them in a box. And so uh, my experience in doing this uh, is on a much smaller scale. Uh, and it came about through work we've done in single molecule biophysics in my lab. Uh, I, I didn't have force envy because I had done a lot of work with optical tweezers and uh, eventually decided that the way to crack the single molecule sequencing problem was to go to uh, uh, single floor for imaging and in fact borrowed TJ's technique of single molecule fret to do it and so these were the first single molecule sequencing experiments and they were done in my lab in early 2000s and I worked out that over the few years it took us to do this we probably spent about half a million to three-quarters million dollars all told to get it done and uh, we published our paper on it and it, it, uh, it uh, caused some interest in the venture capital community we ended up founding a company called Helicose Biosciences try to commercialize it, and it became a true group affair. Uh, we persuaded Steve to sit on the scientific advisory board, Hun Jin Lee did some consulting early on, and Hazen Babcock is still one of the key employees of the company. And they spent about $24 million over a few years uh, to, to build real machines to do this, and they built nine prototype machines, and they scaled up the performance by quite a bit, uh, both in read length and in numbers of templates by many, many orders of magnitude. 
And uh, you know, one of the differences of being in a company is that, uh, as opposed to academia is that they're not so interested in publishing because their main goal is to make a commercial product. But at the same time, a lot of really interesting basic research happens behind the scenes. And so I finally prevailed upon them to publish some of their data that they had taken many years earlier to sort of share with the world some of the things they'd, uh, they'd done. And so now, <coughs> they are just, uh, they've just finished their first set of commercial units uh, and scaled up again by a couple orders of magnitude the number of templates uh, after spending another $60 million or so. And this now, we think, is going to be the fastest DNA sequencer in the world, uh, running at about 90 megabases per hour. And the way to think about it is it sequences about three human genomes a week in throughput. Stanford is the first academic customer, and so we're very excited to get it next month and put it through its paces, through, put it through its paces and see if it does everything the company has been claiming. And <clears throat> the main application is going to be for unraveling the mysteries of uh, stem cells and cancer, uh, basically human biology, but I hope uh, I think we're going to have trouble keeping the pipe full with samples, so I hope to take some of the unused capacity and use it to sequence my own genome. You can think on these scales now. <clears throat> it's really a lot of fun. But, you know, while human genetics is, is of interest to us, uh, it's sort of a parochial interest to us as people, uh, and uh, if you really want to push these physics analogies a little more, you can say that, you know, multicellular organisms are sort of the equivalent of solid-state physics. You know, solid-state matter is what we see around us in the world, and it's really interesting. But the physics of it are pretty hard. And in fact, it's, uh, it's, you have to use a lot of phenomenology, and it's very rare to be able to calculate things from first principles. Whereas uh, with atomic physics, you're a bit closer to first principles. And that's one of the reasons why it's been so powerful, such a powerful tool for, for fundamental physics. <coughs> so microbes, or single cell organisms, are the equivalent atoms of biology. And uh, you can sort of graph out relationships on trees of life. And this is what Darwin was able to do uh, with the knowledge of his time. It's a page out of his lab notebook. But today, thanks to modern molecular methods, you can really make these trees uh, with quantitative value and precision in them, okay? And so, uh, by sequencing a small snippet of one gene that all organisms share, you can map out the degree of similarity between them and use those to calculate uh, evolutionary relationships. And this is sort of what it looks like. So these graphs really have, every line has quantitative value, and it's a measure of distance. And, <coughs> If you look at it, uh, the multicellular organisms are basically right here. Not even all the red, maybe half or two-thirds of the red branches here. And all the rest of the tree uh, are single-cell organisms, okay? And so the vast majority of the diversity of life on Earth is represented by single-cell organisms, no matter how you measure it. And I got interested in trying to explore this because it turns out um, that the evidence for all of these is actually really pretty indirect. Um, just sequencing random snippets of DNA floating around in the environment, basically, is how you infer the existence of these organisms. And uh, it'd be nice to get more genetic information for them and to fill this out. And so <coughs> we started developing uh, tools in my lab to do that that are based around the notion of small plumbing. And as some of you know, I spent uh, quite a number of years trying to develop more sophisticated ways of integrating valves and pumps onto little chips to try to make the biological equivalent of the integrated circuit. And one of the reasons to do this was to try to uh, take individual cells, individual microbes, and amplify their genomes so that you could sequence them. And the reason why that's uh, important relates to the previous slide, that most of those bugs there can't be grown in culture. In fact, 99% of what's out there are the microbes uh, that are inferred to exist can't be grown in culture. And so if you could isolate the individual cells and amplify their genomes somehow, that would give you a way to sequence them and fill out genetic information on the tree of life. This is a picture of of our little amplifier, there's, uh, 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 this is a picture of the chip. The chip is about a centimeter by a centimeter. And there's eight processing units here and a ninth control where cells can be shunted into them and then amplified with biochemical amplifiers. Now, if you think about physical amplifiers, <coughs> I think you guys all know that uh, you can often uh, improve their performance by lowering the temperature. For example, in the CCD cameras used in uh, some of the previous talks for doing single molecule imaging. They're often cooled to lower the, uh, the accumulation of thermal electrons or, or in many cases, straight ahead electronic amplifiers. This is a random graph I pulled off the web from some supplier of cryogenic amplifiers showing the noise going down as a function of temperature. And there's been many, many examples of where this has been incredibly uh, useful in physics, uh, not least of which was when Zionist and Wilson pointed their uh, radio telescope up to the sky, cooled down their amplifier, and the noise didn't go down as much as they thought it would, and from that they discovered cosmic microwave background. 
What's the analogy in biology? Well, temperature is, is not the right variable in that context, but it turns out volume is. And this is one of the reasons why I spent so much time working on plumbing, is that it turns out that there are many interesting physical and biochemical effects that change in interesting ways as you shrink the volume down. And biochemical amplifiers are one of them, okay? So PCR is sort of the most famous biochemical amplifier. It turns out as you shrink the volume of PCR reactions, they become much more efficient and sensitive. It's also true for the amplifier we use in the work to amplify genomes, which is a slightly different one that amplifies all DNA in the sample. And this is uh, some data we took showing uh, the effectiveness of that. So <clears throat> we did uh, single cell uh, genome amplifications in volumes of 60 nanoliters and in volumes of 50 microliters. And then we measured how effective those amplifications were by looking at different loci across the E. coli genome and asking whether they're represented or not, and if so, by how much. And these graphs here tell you the representation of 10 different cells uh, in the, uh, uh, from the 60 nanoliter experiments and here from the 50 microliter. And so you can see that there's a lot of dropouts here and a huge variance, whereas we got uh, very consistent representation in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the nanoliter case. And so this has uh, been really an enabling factor uh, in allowing us to go forward and start doing environmental surveys, capture individual bugs, and sequence their genomes. To give you a sense, uh, for how dire the situation is. This is uh, a dendrogram of the bacterial kingdom. Okay, so remember kingdom, phylum, class, order, so forth. And so kingdom, the grossest level of separation. Uh, phylum comes next. These are all the phyla uh, in the bacterial kingdom and their various relationships. Now, <clears throat> the ones that have a green name after them uh, are ones that have a member that can be grown in culture. The ones that are colored blue the color coding is meant to indicate the number of genome sequencing projects within that phylum. Uh, and the ones that are gray are ones for which there's essentially no genetic information. You can see there's a lot of gray here, even at the phylum level, level never mind class, order, genus, species, so on. <clears throat> we did an environmental survey where we wanted to actually get a genome from this desert right here of gray ones. And these red names are, these red circles and numbers, are the numbers of cells we pulled out from various phyla and experiment we did that I'll describe on the next slide. But we were looking for guys right here in the middle of this desert and we found four from this so-called TM7 phylum. We, uh, <coughs> we did the experiments uh, by looking at what's called the human microbiome, five minutes. <coughs> Boy, that went by fast. And <coughs> I will not tell you too much about it except to say that we've been able to sequence the, uh, the DNA we got out. This is the assembly of our first TM7. We got about three megabases, which is the better part of the genome. We've gone on to do about half a dozen more single cell genomes there in various stages of annotation and assembly. Another question we've been interested in is uh, to try to really predict biology from physics measurements and to say, you know, if you are going to not probe the physiology of the organism. You just want to make physical measurements about, say, molecular interactions. Is it possible to, uh, to predict some biology from that? And it's sort of in this context of systems biology and gene regulatory networks where people make these diagrams that describe the relationships between proteins that bind to DNA and turn on genes and try to make them look like a circuit diagram. Whereas the difference is in a circuit diagram, you know everything about the device physics of every component. Whereas in this case, if you ask about the the device physics there, all you get back is, oh, there's an interaction, that's all we know. And it's really a limitation of measurement technology. And so we decided to develop uh, a better way to measure uh, the properties of these such interactions and did it using the small plumbing. This is a picture of the chip. It turns out to be a pretty sensitive measurement of affinities down to binding constants of tens of micromolar. Uh, and it has uh, substantial parallelization. We're able to measure a couple thousand different interactions all at the same time. And this has allowed us to ask questions such as, if you take a transcription factor, can you measure its binding energy to all possible DNA sequences? And the answer is yes, and we call those free energy landscapes of binding. Uh, <clears throat> so it's sort of a lookup table of, uh, you give me a DNA sequence, I'll tell you uh, what the energy of binding is for several different transcription factors. And then we've used that. Since we have the energy, we can just use the Boltzmann factor to work out the probability of binding. Uh, we've used that in conjunction with knowledge of the genome, in this case of yeast, uh, to predict the probability of the transcription factor binding in front of any given gene. Done that for every gene in the yeast genome, and we find out that, in fact, we're able to do a pretty good job of predicting the functions of these transcription factors. And, in fact, uh, you know, we're able to do as well or better than people who are doing measurements on yeast. We don't harm any yeast in our experiments. It's a purely physical experiment. 
but we do pretty well. So these plumbing tools have uh, enabled us to explore a lot of different fields. Um, <clears throat> it's, been, it's been quite a bit of fun for me and my students. Uh, in particular, we've used them to uh, uh, develop new ways of doing x-ray crystallography and structural biology. Uh, a lot of that was in collaboration with Jim Berger here at Berkeley, and we've taken a lot of data up at the ALS, the synchrotron up the hill here at the lab. It's been uh, a great tool for us. Um, <clears throat> I guess the last thing I want to say is <clears throat> when I was a first-year graduate student, I read this article in Physics Today about uh, supersymmetry and unification of the standard model, and it had this that figure in it that really stuck in my mind, which illustrated uh, this notion of running coupling constants and the fact that you know, as you increase the decoupling constants of the various parts of the standard model depend on the energy or the mass scale. And as you increase the energy scale, they change, and they might all converge to a point. Okay? And that's one way to understand unification. We have the hypothesis here. And I thought that was really neat. And it kind of stuck in my mind. And as I've tried to come up with ways to tell my physics colleagues you know, what I find interesting about biology, what the interesting physics of biology is, uh, I decided to try to make a similar diagram. And this was something that I put together for an article that Rob Phillips and I wrote in Physics Today a couple years ago, where we tried to plot up the various uh, sorts of uh, phenomena, physical phenomena one runs into in biology. And we plotted them up as an energy scale as a function of length scale. And so uh, as Carlos and some of the other speakers mentioned, one of the amazing things about biological molecules is they act like continuum mechanical. Uh, uh, you don't need quantum mechanics to describe many interesting properties of them. And so you can work out what the bending energy is of a rod or the fracture of a rod uh, using classical mechanics and plot that up as a function of the size of the rod. Uh, and you get these lines. You can work out the electrostatic energy it takes to put a bunch of charges on a spherical shell as a function of the size of the shell. You make a few assumptions about density. You get that line. You can work out the energy of chemical bonds uh, either by calculating the energy of an electron in a box, which is shown on this line, or plotting the actual energies of various chemical bonds like ATP and hydrogen bonds or the energy in the nucleus, or the protons. You try to break it apart into particles. And of course, the thermal energy is invariant length scale. And the amazing thing is that all of these lines come together and intersect in the same region. And what makes biophysics such an interesting problem for me is that this means that you know, biology is able to take advantage of this by transforming energy from chemical to mechanical to electrostatic and so forth, uh, because they all converge there, right at this length scale of nanometers and piconewtons. And uh, I think you've heard in some of the earlier talks many examples of that. And this is uh, something that gives it sort of enduring interest uh, as a physical problem. And I'll stop here so we can get a bite to eat. OK, I'm sure Steve would be happy to take uh, one or two questions, but we're a little behind. Everyone's hungry. Oh, not you. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, so, so it seems to me that from an evolutionary point of view, it's not Which one? Too, the first one? Yeah, that, that one right okay. there. So maybe it's not too surprising that all the multicellular stuff gets clustered together because you figure once something like that develops, it sort of takes off and sort of tells you that you don't, you don't have separate um, uh, uh, lines that, that have led to, to these sort of, at least not very separate lines. But I guess the thing that, that, that I'm wondering about is why is there There are protozoa right here. Those are single cell protozoa. Okay? Yeah. And I should say that there are very interesting questions here where people still are not sure about the topology of this. You know, and there's notions that uh, the archaea and, and the bacteria actually came together in a fusion to create eukaryotes. And so there, there's very interesting open questions about this. And it's because the data is so limited that, that they're controversial and not answered. And that's some of the motivation for filling it out more completely. That's our common ancestor right there. That's, the, that's our common ancestor right there, first living cell. No, it's totally inferred. Yeah. Any other questions? If not, let's thank all the speakers in the session.